Hey, what's up guys? Matt with The Movement System. Today we're going to talk about the difference between reciprocal inhibition and autogenic inhibition. We're going to talk about exactly how the muscle spindles do reciprocal inhibition and the Golgi tendon organs do autogenic inhibition. Let's go ahead and dive into it. Okay, so now if we're looking at this picture, we're representing those muscle spindle fibers, those intrafusal fibers is blue, and then the actual contractile muscle fibers is red here. Okay, just to orient you guys to what we're looking at with the muscle spindle, if these are our contractile muscle fibers made of actin and myosin, and contracting and shortening and overlapping, that would be the gray. The red are sensory fibers that are in between our contractile fibers. So our whole muscle is made up of a lot of contractile fibers with some of these sensory intrafusal muscle spindle fibers within that muscle that are sending out these signals. So what you can see is this muscle spindle, this blue, is sending out a signal. So this is a sensory fiber, it's sending out a signal to the spinal cord, and now that signal is gonna do two things. It's going to inhibit the antagonist muscle on the opposite side of the joint. So this is our agonist muscle, it's sensing some stretch, and then it's going to inhibit over here our antagonist, the opposite muscle. It's also going to facilitate activation of the agonist. So what our muscle spindle does is it senses muscle stretch, and then it facilitates itself, its agonist, and then it's gonna inhibit the antagonist. So that inhibition of the antagonist muscle is what we call reciprocal inhibition. So in the case of throwing a baseball, when we're in the layback phase of pitching, we're gonna have a stretch through the anterior shoulder joint. In that situation, we're gonna be activating the muscle spindles of the front of the shoulder. So the anterior delt, for example, is stretched in that position. It's a quick stretch because it's a quick movement. And what's gonna happen in that case is it's going to send a signal because it's sensing stretch and it's going to cause activation of the agonist, meaning activation of the anterior shoulder to prevent it from overstretching, and it's also gonna inhibit the posterior shoulder. So what that's gonna do is it's gonna sense the stretch in the front of the shoulder, activate within the front of the shoulder, inhibit within the back of the shoulder. And both of those actions are meant to protect the shoulder joint from overstretching. So a common test for the muscle spindles is the patellar tendon reflex. So what we're doing in that test is we're doing a quick stretch of the patellar tendon, which is actually going to stretch the quadricep muscle. The body senses that stretch from the muscle spindles of the quad, and it sends a signal to activate the quads to kick the leg out, as well as to inhibit the hamstrings from keeping the leg down. So it's kind of doing that double action there. It's activating the quadricep through that dotted line here, so it's facilitating the agonist there, but it's also inhibiting the hamstring muscle to allow the leg to kick out. Okay, so moving on to the Golgi tendon organ. The Golgi tendon organ, we can see here, is represented as this black dot. So if this is the muscle, this is the tendon that's connecting the muscle to the bone, and within that tendon, we are representing the Golgi tendon organ as this black dot. And obviously there are thousands of them within the tendon, but we're just representing it as one here, which is sending a signal out to the spinal cord, and in this case, back to the same muscle. And that is called autogenic inhibition, sending a signal out and back to the same muscle. So what this is doing is sensing tension in the tendon. That could come from a forceful muscle contraction or, for example, a prolonged stretch. So let's use the example that we have a one rep max back squat and we're really squatting a heavy weight. Through the quads, we're putting a lot of force through that tendon. So again, the patellar tendon, in this case, is under a lot of tension. So we talked about the muscle spindles that would be under a quick stretch. In the case of a one rep max back squat, it's under a lot of tension, and we're firing the Golgi tendon organs. So what's happening in that scenario is as we're sending that really strong signal that we're getting a lot of tension through the tendon, the spinal cord is sending a reflex back to decrease the activation of the quadricep muscle. So this is actually decreasing the amount of weight you can lift because it's protecting the muscle from putting too much tension through the tendon. So it's causing agonist inhibition. One training implication of the Golgi tendon organ is that if we are chronically working at really high loads, 
one, two, three rep max, 85 plus percent of one rep max. So we're doing heavy training. We can actually dampen the Golgi tendon organ response and train our muscles to work at these high thresholds without using a lot of that autogenic inhibition that would actually decrease our strength. So over time, we can actually dampen the GTO response, dampen that autogenic inhibition to allow us to lift more heavy loads if we practice that consistently. If this video gave you that aha moment and really helped you, make sure you hit the like button. Another training principle involving the muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs is speed training and motor pattern efficiency training. So if we're doing training that's fast and we're getting more and more efficient in a quick movement like sprinting or throwing a ball, what we're gonna do is over time, as our motor patterns are more efficient, we get improved muscular coordination, what's gonna happen is we're gonna reduce antagonist coactivation. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna allow more of that agonist activation pathway without the need for that antagonist to really coactivate and slow us down. So as our motor pattern gets more efficient, we can actually dampen that antagonist coactivation. And then one more, more clinical application of this is that in general, as we age, we actually have more coactivation around joints and that's due to the added need for stability at the joint, which would actually reduce the efficiency and the power of the agonist muscles. So that's why we actually wanna maintain joint stability throughout our lifetime, so that way we can actually maintain agonist force production and, and keep high levels of activity. All right guys, I hope that was helpful for you. If it was, go ahead and hit the like button. If you wanna see more videos like this, go ahead and subscribe, and make sure you follow me on Instagram at The Movement System. I'll see you guys in the next one, thanks.